Miriam, welcome to the ScaleX Insider Podcast. I'm really delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Brandon. It's such a pleasure to be on the show here with you today. Uh, thank you. As we've been speaking, our vision is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small and medium-sized businesses to scale with purpose. Now, we're going to get into that deep today, but in a couple of lines, what does scaling with purpose mean to you, Miriam? I think um, scaling with purpose means that you are open to embracing a new business model that is a lot more inclusive, um, that is embracing change, that is looking to, um, you know, give back more than it's taking. And for me, this is what, um, you know, at the heart of scaling with purpose really means, because it means that you are willing to challenge existing business models and changing the way we drive business models in this world. So for me, this is what scaling with purpose really means. Yeah, I love that. Uh, there's a great saying, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. And given that yeah. only 2% of SMEs achieve scaling, clearly the other 98% have to think about how to, to change what they're currently doing. So moving on, I mean, your background is fascinating. I've just consumed your, your book, your wonderful book, Brands on a Mission, which we will put the link to in our show notes. It's a wonderful book. Uh, you describe your background in the book. Can you give our listeners a brief journey to the, of how you've arrived to write the book and give us a little bit of your background? You can, you can go as far back as you wish. Yeah, no, I mean, if you've read the book, you probably, um, you probably see that my fascination and my interest in, in trying to serve populations that are very vulnerable in this world goes ways back, right? So I'm originally from Mali. I grew up in, um, in a developing country in, in the northern part in Mali, in Timbuktu. And I fell into a septic tank when I was about 10 years old. I don't know whether you remember that story in the book. I do. And, um, and I think for me, this was, the, um, this was obviously a horrible moment where, you know, I thought I was going to drown and actually drown in shit, which is probably the worst thing that can happen. But, um, but I, actually, it was the start of my purpose. It was the start Part of me thinking about a life um, of work and professional achievements that's all around um, health and well-being and um, you know and 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 you know I went on and you know ended up uh, um, you know doing an engineering degree um, you know went and um, you know in, in water and waste engineering so all the things that were right and then I realized I went to work in um, in an in an NGO in Burundi in uh, in, in rural Africa in internally displaced camps and I was building toilets and hand washing facilities and obviously I was responding to what the donors needed uh, which was you know to help those beneficiaries and count and you know put all those toilets there and then nobody was using them so I started thinking about the fact that um, you know whilst we were responding to what the donor wanted which was to give us money to build toilets that the beneficiaries themselves um, were using all those beautiful toilets to store their grains to store their belongings but they were not using them for 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 going to the toilets and then I thought there was something fundamentally wrong with the whole aid system. There was something wrong with the way we were perceiving this woman as a beneficiary. So I went back, I did my doctorate in public health um, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, thinking about behavior change, because I was, you know, I was determined to understand how you could really get them to use those toilets. Um, you could see my fascinations of falling into the septic tanks, building toilets, getting people to use toilets. So it, it goes way back. Um, and I believe that, and we'll come back to that, uh, how much your personal purpose drives you into your work. So I'm sure we'll have a conversation to discuss this, um, you know, an opportunity to discuss this later on. And then I realized, um, obviously, that there was a lot of learnings around, you know, why exactly people were not washing their hands. I spent, you know, four years visiting hundreds of toilets, recording kids, you know, graffitis in Senegal, in Indonesia, in their toilets, understanding a bit more around, you know, what were the reasons where people were not, you know, using the toilets and washing their hands. Then when I finished this doctorate, I um, went to present my findings to Unilever and Unilever had funded my research, you know, no, unknowingly, it's not me, they were funding the, the school for some research in this general area, which ended up funding my PhD. And then when I presented my research, they offered me a job. And when they offered me a job, I thought, oh my goodness, this is it. Um, this is the chance for me to really change, you know, the way it is. Here's this amazing corporation with so much resources that is interested in changing hand washing with soap. But what I didn't actually realize was that I was going to fall in love with a word and the word was going to be consumer. 
And I realized um, when I joined Unilever that Unilever was putting all their resources, their best talents, their energy in, in getting that same woman um, you know, to actually uh, convince her to wash her hands. So they were putting a soap in front of her that had the kind of fragrance she wanted at the right price. Um, they were putting together a, a toilet cleaner that were actually removing the other so people actually wanted to use the toilet. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is it. So on one hand, you know, here I was in a place where there was no resources and we were looking at this beneficiary as, you know, uh, somebody that was absolutely powerless and, you know, with a lot of hand me pity downs. And then on the other side, that same woman, because she had one dollar in her pocket, um, you know, was actually, you know, her needs were really taken into consideration, her aspirations were taken into consideration. And this amazing corporation was actually spending a lot of time understanding what she wanted. Um, and I think for me, this was the complete um, turnaround when I was like, oh my goodness, there is so much potential if you get the business model right to be able to affect um, the life of, of hundreds of millions of this type of women, for example, and, and women in rural areas. So I think for me, this was the, the starting point. I spent 15 years, 15, 15 years in Unilever in marketing. Um, I wanted to understand everything about the four P's, the price, the, you know, the, the product, the placement, um, you know, the, the promotions, the behavior change program we could drive. And then I realized that there was an opportunity um, to be able to take what this learning that we've done and this framework around, you know, how to infuse marketing with real ethics to more companies and more brands. So I went to Harvard, took a senior fellowship for a year at the, at the Harvard Kennedy School. And then I wrote this book reflected in my experience in Unilever of 15 years and wrote the book and said, look, this is time. It's time for us to actually be able to, to drive this um, and, um, and be able to support this. So this is why the book came about. And then I decided to actually set up my own company to be able to help more brands and more companies in this, in this, in this line. Well, well done you. And there's a number of things and I want to put in context in terms of connecting your purpose with the vision that you created. And this is one person from, you know, a rural part of, of Africa who then set about creating a vision to have one seventh of the world, you know, one billion people wash their hands and to give the listeners a sense of setting a vision and then you know, not understanding how they were going to do that, but just being compelled by a purpose and setting a vision, one person. And I mean, how, how close did you get you? I mean, you, you achieved that vision, uh, Maria, yep. which is just incredible. Yeah, you know, no, 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 it is incredible. And it, it is, I mean, it, it wasn't my achievement alone. It's an achievement of an entire corporations, right? And it's an, it's an achievement of actually the corporations, but also a lot of the partners that we worked with. But the truth is, is that I did set the vision. I did set the vision of reaching 1 billion people almost 10 years, 12 years ago. And, um, and the reality is, is that, you know, we managed to mobilize this entire company to believe in this, um, in this vision, to put in place the system, to create the kind of program that would drive the change. And we managed to get, you know, the world's largest schools program in 450 million, um, you know, school children in 19 languages, you know, for example, in over 50 countries, we're actually singing and, you know, doing all the hand washing dance that we had created. So for that alone, I feel super proud. I feel super proud of the opportunity that obviously Unilever has given me the platform because being the biggest soap company and also an ability for them to listen to the kind of vision and drive that I had. Um, you know, I don't know whether I would have been able to do the same in any other company, but I definitely managed to do it in this company that had not only the right ethics for it, but also the right framework and also believed in that this would change the way they do business. And indeed, their business model changed after this, right? So this became the way in which many brands um, could actually operate and, 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 and experience growth, right? Yeah, it's, it's just incredible. The second principle of our Scalex model is purpose and vision. And we'll get into this a little bit more, but giving your compelling purpose 
you know, really initiated by that kind of horrible experience, which turned out to be in many respects an experience that has changed 1 billion people's lives in terms of your early encounter with a septic tank. Can you recall the time or the moment whenever you dared to, to, to take that seed of thought or whenever you had that kind of seed of thought about what if we could change the lives of 1 billion people and at, you know, where were you, what, you know, what led up to that? And when did you articulate and communicate that? When were you bold enough to come out and say, this is what I want to do? Um, I was in Lifebuoy. I was a social mission manager. I was hired there and we were driving programs. And I was first hired actually as a partnership manager. And then after six months to a year, after six months, I think I said, this is just not for me. Like, I don't want to run around doing partnerships and stand there with, you know, CEOs and brand managers taking pictures and handing over a check to a, a charity um, where I, you, you've, ex, you've heard my experience with the whole aid sector and the beneficiaries and the donor. And I was like, I did not come here to do that. I came here because you are the world's largest soap manufacturer. You have the network. You are making sure that these women and children around the world have access to a bar of soap. Now, I want to be able to take this opportunity that you're speaking to all these populations every time to be able to change their behavior for good and positively. And I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, like the only way we could do that is actually if we could articulate a goal that would be big enough. Now, um, we were very lucky because Paul Pullman at that time came in and he had set up his, you know, the USLP, Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which, you know, wanted to um, double the, 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 the business whilst, you know, doubling its, its social impact also and reducing its, you know, its negative, um, its, you know, negative impact as well. I mean, and, you know, they came and they said, well, what could you do? And I said, well, actually, you are already every second you're selling to 116 women around the world. Why not get those, those you know, thousands of women that you, that you reach to actually embrace the behavior change? Because if you look at the same demographic that the Lifebuoy brand at the time was reaching, um, it was exactly the same demographic that the UN was actually trying to reach, for example, in India. 87% of households were actually using the life boy soap. So it made such a difference to be able to drive that. And I thought this is very interesting. And this is what we need to do. Our listeners may challenge the fact that you say, well, that's okay for Unilever, you know, look at their reach, they're a household brand you know, yeah. uh, multi-million pound marketing budgets, no doubt. And we'll come back to the, the importance of marketing as you assert. Uh, what would you say to those leaders of small and medium-sized enterprises in terms of the relevance of purpose and vision in terms of driving their scaling ambitions if they feel that it's a little bit abstract or there's too much purpose washing going on at the moment? Where would you make the connect to them and the relevance and importance to them? And, I, and that's a superb question, Brendan, because I get that a lot. But I, I want to first start by telling people that when I joined Lifebuoy, Lifebuoy was a regional brand of less than a hundred million euro brand. Right. Today we are, they are almost, a, they're over one billion euro brand. Oh, wow. right? So just, um, you know, so if you think about some of the social enterprise or SMEs that are speaking to me, the scale isn't so unbelievable. Now, yeah. the question was being bold enough to rethink your business model by embedding the mission at the heart of it. I think that is the question that I keep asking uh, and, and wondering. So it's about rethinking about the reason why you were, you were created or yeah. why you want to exist and what is the ultimate impact that you want to drive. I mean, you know, I, I keep thinking about what you know like you don't you even if you want to differentiate yourself from your competitors there is no better differentiation than connecting with a need that you're trying to respond to in a very in a very distinct way right and i think for me this is where it makes a huge difference yeah no i i, I completely agree and we had marga hoik on previously in season two the author of the trillion dollar shift who yeah. asserts that business for good is good for business you know so uh, and again you know reaffirmed by yourself going back to the, your time in marketing and 
uh, this will be an affront to some of the finance people listening and some of the engineers listening. And But you assert that, which will be music to the marketeers' ears, that marketing is the most important function in a company. You know, for me, again, having come through an SME, for many SME leaders, marketing is one of those functions that are almost considered as the coloring in department until you reach a certain scale and then you realize the importance of it. But, you know, why... Why do you think it's the most important function? What has led to your strong opinion on this? And can you give examples of, you know, where you've witnessed the power of marketing? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, look, I was trying to change behaviors, right? And a lot of um, the behaviors that we're trying to drive, um, you know, especially at the at the heart of health and well-being are, are behaviors that nobody wants to do, right? I mean, there's there's nothing appealing with, you know, drinking a glass of water, um, you know, compared to, you know, getting somebody to drink a glass of Coke, for example, or any sugary drink. It's the same thing with, you know, like what's the benefit that you would get in, you know, reducing your, your, your harmful use of alcohol, for example, and, you know, drinking a glass of water in between um, your two beers or, or, or eating something so you don't binge drink, you know, getting people to, you know, sleep under mosquito nets, um, you know, and using insecticide. Um, getting people, for example, to wash their hands, obviously we've talked about this, or use a toilet cleaner so they can reduce malodor. And a lot of the reasons why those behaviors um, are not happening is the reason why a lot of the, you know, the, the pressing problems in public health is actually happening, right? And I think for me, that was always a big problem, right? The big question here becomes, how do you make sure, um, you know, that you can set out norms that are going to have some sort of social influencing that can get majority of people to adopt some of these behaviors. And I think if we adopt some of these behaviors, and I mean, I go as far as saying that even racism, you know, is a, is a public health issue. And it's something that needs to be tackled with the same level of urgencies and, 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 and um, agency as well, right? So I feel like, um, I, you know, a lot of the norms set out there is actually set out by marketing. And it's set out and um, the negative norms as well, right? I mean, a lot of the toxic masculinity, a lot of the obesity, a lot of the way we eat junk, um, a lot of, you know, who decides what is cool and what is not cool is marketeers. So I was trying to also give marketeers a new lens of what, how amazing that, that um, profession can be, because I've seen what you can do if you can make actually eating green leafy vegetables cool. <laughs> because that reduces iron deficiency anemia, for example, right? If you could get water and um, drinking to say, well, this is what real cool people do. They actually drink two liters of water per day. I mean, that is what you're supposed to do, right? So I just find that there is an opportunity here where you can take a lot of the learnings um, that marketing has been using just to position its own products to change that for good. And I, 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 I feel that if you can use and you can infuse marketing with some of these public health ethics and they can understand that there's a limit to, you know, this consumption, um, you know, this, this consumption can be a lot more, um, you know, I get conscientious, you know, like this is the kind of change that you would be able to drive. Yeah. So it's bringing a level of consciousness and responsibility to bear in terms of the marketing function and getting people within that marketing function to, to understand the strength and power of that function and to, in many respects, question the, their, their role and, and what they're promoting also. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's exactly what it is. I mean, it's not just the advertising codes because it's beyond the advertising code. Yes, we have the advertising code. It's more around being, being clear of the power that you have in terms of driving these positive norms that will shape generations, right? So it's about making sure that the girl feels that, you know, it sees herself more represented in the media so that she knows that this is what beauty looks like, that yeah. this is real beauty, right? This is about, you know, the body confidence and less, you know, less filtering and, and making sure that, you know, you know, girls get a sense uh, of, of, you know, don't have to deal with body dissatisfaction, which is 
you know, the leading cause of depression, you know, substance abuse and everything else, and the inability for girls to even negotiate, you know, a, a condom use, for example, yeah. right? So I think it's, it's, you know, I think about all of this and I, I, I think about what kind of world you want to live in and what kind of inclusive world, uh, world you want to live in. And this is where we get into that conversation. Yeah. And as the father of two teenage daughters, if you can uh, begin your, your next chapter by influencing the marketeers that sit behind the social media, I think you would, you, you would um, uh, change a, a generation because certainly some of the influences that are coming through in social media for, for young teenage girls and boys, I have a teenage boy as well, uh, it has to be questioned. So I, it's a, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought of that in terms of the responsibility of marketeers to really question the purpose of the company that they're representing and they're out there evangelizing. So it's a it's a great point. And I I, I want to pick up on something, you know, do the I suppose wanting to encourage the world to practice better hygiene habits seems an obvious um, kind of an obvious mission or purpose, but is it something, is purpose only something that certain brands can do or does it apply to every SME company out there? Well, I mean, to the exception of tobacco, unless it's rent the world's largest uh, um, anti-smoking uh, campaigns, you know, which, you know, could be, but I think it seems rather, it, it seems a bit difficult, or gun control, or seeing where you are. I think there is a role for everything. I mean, you know, I keep talking, for example, like I, I, I watched, you know, with the whole um, Black Lives Matters movement and the George Floyd, um, you know, elements and everything that happened with, with that. And I watched a lot of brands, you know, remove their, you know, their names and change their names and, you know, like Auntie Jemima and thinking about this. And I, and I thought, well, you are the leading, um, you know, provider of a breakfast. Can you not actually put at the core of your purpose, maybe getting people to eat fruits with them, you know, like with their, their breakfast. That's a lot more powerful than just changing a name, right? Because I think that those kind of messages might actually lead to um, better, you know, diet diversity and get people, to, you know, especially the, the same population that is struggling so much. So, you know, Black Americans in the U.S. are struggling with obesity and they were probably the, the worst hit off during um, COVID, right? So get them to have better diet diversity. I mean, I find that a lot more powerful than the, just a, a name change, you know? So it's about thinking about not just your product, but what else um, can your product do as part of a better lifestyle? and seeing it um, you know, inclusively. And I see that brands that are actually endorsing some of these um, you know, principles and that are thinking in terms of the good of the consumers are doing much better than brands that don't. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love this. And I, and I wanna pick up on the, the UN SDGs, which you reference in your book and we've spoken about before on the, on the program. But uh, before we do that, uh, within your book, you speak about the purpose tree uh, based on the, the, the African Bobo tree. And, and it's the first time that I've come across a framework for developing purpose. So I'd love you to take, uh, take us through that, if you would, Miriam. No, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I use the Baobab tree as a... Um as a you know visual representation of of you know a framework to help brands um, bridge the divide between what they say versus what they do in a way that could benefit communities right i wanted to challenge the business model um, so that it it actually doesn't leave the consumer worst off after the transaction so that actually it puts the consumers right at the center of the conversations and get them to actually co-create where we are right so i thought this is something that is absolutely critical and that we 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 could you know i wanted to do so i thought about what what does it take to really drive um social impact and business growth and i thought 
well, here's this, this tree, which basically can live over a thousand years, which is, you know, a source of food, of shelter, or water. It's a place where a lot of very um, deep conversations or meaningful conversations in villages happen in Africa. It's, there's even one in South Africa that's, you know, been there for over 6,000 years. Wow. And what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do here was to um, you know, to, 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 to basically go deep in its roots and say, what can brands learn from a baobab tree? And, and you know, it, they have the same sort of stature or they can have, right? That can withstand a lot of weather. Um, and deeply rooted um, are what it would really take to drive um, change. And I, I think about five roots. So imagine this baobab tree, which I hope you can put in your podcast or, or, or visualization so people Absolutely. can see that. Um, you know, and if you want pictures, I'll send that to you. But I mean, it, 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 you know, like looking at these five roots and saying, root number one, is your business model trying to change a positive uh, behavior or, you know, social norms in society so that you can really drive um, with every marketing cent that you are spending, with every product that you are selling, are you doing something positive? Think about it from that business model angle, because if not, it's just CSR, right? And, you know, the CSR has its role, philanthropy has its role. But, um, you know, if you want to change your business model, you need to challenge first the behavior you're trying to drive with the consumer so that you're really driving that change. The second thing is, you know, it's not just what you stand for. It's also who you stand with, right? So the second route for me is the partnerships. What kind of partnerships are you going to drive that really help you get scale and depth um, and, uh, uh, as well? Um, and then the third one is, is what I call advocacy and systemic change, right? Can you get to a cause that's bigger than yourself? Um, and can you work together with even competitors to be able to, you know, think about um, a systemic change in which you could drive real, real change, right? So, so that for me is, is the brand advocacy. The third, the fourth one is on, um, is measuring because you measure what you treasure is the reality, right? I mean, or you treasure what you measure. Um, you know, so I, and I always think about how we need to keep a lot of these businesses accountable to driving the good that they need to drive, right? So what is this accountability that needs to happen that will help you drive that, right? And I think for me, that is one of the, um, the, um, the conversations that needed to happen and that we need to think about, right? Um, and um, so I thought about the measurements. So helping brands, you know, measure obviously the, the financial impact of, of, of their purpose, but also thinking about, you know, what, is, what does that mean in terms of talent um, retention? What does this mean about the other elements of driving purpose at the heart of your business model? What will it do for your reputation? Um, you know, for example. And then the fifth one is, is obviously um, what I call winning corporate, um, uh, a winning corporate support, which is, you know, helping from, you know, the leadership angle, um, you know, seeing what kind of leadership you need to have, what kind of um, talent you need to create, um, what kind of culture internally you will be able to do that enables these new business models to thrive within your company. So this is what it's pretty simple. It's five roots. Each of those roots can be a book on its own, but um, you know, it at least gives us some clear guidance um, on how to do that. And in, in the book, each root actually has some questions and guidance, and I've written it in such a way that it can help people actually derive and use that. Yeah. No, it's it's a it's a really practical framework, and I encourage our listeners to to buy the book and to to study the framework because there's I always say there's genius and simplicity so I, I love the way that you have have laid it out and, and linked it back the meta the the, the baobab tree is a great metaphor for creating a vision you know in terms of the tree planting a seed yeah you know of a tree under whose shade you may never sit you know creating a vision which ultimately will create a legacy but you as the leader may never uh, experience the, the the ultimate benefit of, but actually you're you're inspired and motivated to to do something bigger than yourself. It's about serving a we rather than a me. So, you know, I, I really like the I like the metaphor of the Bob tree in terms of you know using that as the framework for purpose. 
you've mentioned that you know one of the roots is partnerships and and our ninth principle in the scale x uh, 10 principle model is partnerships and i'd love you to share some examples of of really compelling partnerships in action towards a, a purpose so I mean, I love this, this partnership, which is a partnership we set up in Lifeboy when we were, you know, I mean, Sight Savers um, is an NGO and um, nonprofit and it's the world leading organizations in, um, in um, you know, helping, um, you know, as, uh, visually impaired people to actually, you know, thrive, but also to prevent it. And one of the leading diseases that's there is actually trachoma. Um, the leading blinding disease. And the way to be able to avoid trachoma is to make sure that you face wash. And um, Sight Savers came to Lifeboy and said, look, you, you guys are doing so much work on hand washing. Can we not link hand washing with face washing? And can we not develop a program? And here's this, um, you know, nonprofit that's thinking about this corporate and thinking, actually, if I want to get face washing, I need to work with this private sector company so that we can work. So the partnership was more a question around, yes, of course we needed together, we got together, we managed to get the resources. We actually got some additional donors to put money into this program. But the point was, there was a complementarity of um, you are doing face washing. You're the expert at behavior change in this. We know a lot about trachoma. How, how do we work together to come up with a joint program, right? So I think the way I look at partnerships more and more needs to be partnerships that create what I call the win-win-win. So win for the private sector, because obviously you're opening up new frontiers. You're really opening up new areas that you should be thinking about. But um, new um the, the second win is obviously win for the public sector because you are thinking about uh, working on new business models which you wouldn't have normally right so and you are thinking about um you know capabilities that maybe you don't have in-house and then the final win is definitely the win for the populations because they get access to um you know services and programs which you know it is beyond what they would have normally gotten either from the aid sector or the private sector. But we need to make sure that all of us are being kept accountable to that because that is the most important win, is responding to the needs of the most vulnerable. And how much of this, in terms of actually creating partnerships, winning partnerships, rests in the, the psyche, the mindset of the leader who I would imagine would would be required to have an abundance mindset as opposed to kind of a scarcity mindset, as Stephen Covey alluded to in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And, you know, trusting that or viewing it that we are, you know, we're, we're inspired by a compelling purpose. We have this vision and let's trust that the, that this relationship will work as opposed to on what I've seen in the past, others kind of guarding what they have and not putting it out there for fear that, you know, competitors may lean on it or, and, and ultimately it, nobody wins in the end. So how much of it best in this, in the, the psyche and the mindset of the leader? And, and I'd love to also just leading on from that, get your, your view on the importance of creating a vision, putting the vision out there on the understanding that you don't know how you're going to achieve what you've, what you've, you know, stated that you'd like to achieve, uh, but you trust that once you put it out there, the partners will come. So there's two, two aspects that one, the psychology of the leader and the importance of that. And two, the, the importance of sharing your vision publicly in order to, you know, attract the right partners. I mean, partnership is so crucial, right? And it's so difficult. Um, and yet I think it is a core competencies of the future for business leaders in the future, right? So I think understanding how you're going to operate in a world, um, you know, and understanding what your place as a business a leader will be and what your response is to some of these social issues and how to embrace the SDGs as you know, there's no better social issues than the SDGs combined to figure out which business model um, needs to answer to which SDGs indicators, right? So I find, I think that's a breeding ground for amazing social mission that 
businesses should just you know run to and develop their business model around so i think for me that's definitely a starting point um i'm not sure you know, i'm not sure whether i'm answering your question right actually right now but um yeah i could talk about partnership for a really long time and i, I yeah well maybe. let me ask it in a different way how do how do leaders who have established a, a bold vision attract the winning partners Well, I think number one, you need to measure, right? And you need to measure the credible impact of what you're driving. If you're saying you want to help eliminate, you know, um, child mortality through hygiene, you need to make sure that you are showing that you are driving hand washing behavior change and you are indeed getting more people to wash hands, um, that you are indeed getting more people to you know, uh, be beaten less by mosquitoes through your insecticide and, and all of that. So I'm, I think um, the, there, is, there is no other way to do that but to measure your impact and then being able to share that. Then the public sector starts talking. I mean, I remember 15 years ago, it was, I was not even allowed to be sitting anywhere in the public sector. And I talk about it a little bit in my book, coming into a, a meeting in Lifebuoy where you know, I was told, well, no, we are here to speak to Unilever. We're not here to speak to Lifebuoy. Like we don't want to speak, but I was like, but there is no other brand that will speak about hand washing except Lifebuoy. So you're going to have to speak to me and you're going to have to speak about where we, where we are. And the, the conception of partnership at that time was a conception and it still is in many public sector organization is that, you know, at the very best you hand over a check and we do a nice ceremony where you've handed over the check and this is what we're about, right? Because you're the private sector and you should feel guilty about making this money and we are saving lives. So we are in two different camps. Like you cannot be aiming, dreaming to be saving lives when you are making money. That is completely, you know, like a not, it, it, the two cannot work together. And, um, and I remember being in a conversations and I won't mention which organization, I think I do actually in the book where I say, you know, we must be running out of life to save if we can't actually have this conversation where, you know, you are looking at this brand, which has 70% of the soap market in India, and you are not willing to do a partnership with them. So I think we pushed a lot of boundaries at the time. I think today things are a lot easier. Things are a lot more um, you know, the, the, the public sector is coming around to these business models and, and they're seeing the commitment through decades and years of, of, of articulations of programs. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's taken a long time to get to that. Yeah, you mentioned in your, in your book that not, not all profit is bad. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Profit is very good. <laughs> I believe that, you know, profit can be purposeful and purpose needs to be profitable, you know? And I, I really, really believe at the heart of that. I think without profit, you can't actually have a sustainable model that is helping people actually, because it is because of the profit that a soap company makes that they will keep thinking of products that can be more affordable, more accessible. They will keep thinking of new network. They will keep doing that. So the question is obviously to keep them accountable and, and, and think about a world where we're not forgetting the ones that can't really afford um, you know, some of these products, right? And I think, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not blind. I also know the limitations of the word consumers today and consumerism, right? So I understand um, a lot more than, you know, I was 23 years old when I was joining Unilever. But, you know, I, I, I think about, um, you know, how do you make this more inclusive, equitable world happen? Um, and how do you make this happen in a way that, um, you know, you continue being um, profitable because again, you know, like profit is not bad. Profit is a good thing. Profit makes um, the world go round. Profit actually allows you to be able to keep investing. And actually a lot of public sector partners want to understand how you're gonna make the interventions you're jointly doing profitable for you because it's almost a guarantee that you will stick around because you've got a real incentive to do so. Of course, you're going to keep washing hands. You're a soap. What else are you going to do? <laughs> you know, like, of course, you're going to be talking about safe sex. You're a condom. <laughs> yeah. You know, of yeah. course, you're going to keep talking about eliminating malaria. You're, in how, you're an insecticide. You know, like, 
of course you're going to be, you know, like, so I, you know, I think about, you know, like a lot of these reasons, um, and this is where I thought, you know, not all profit can be bad, right? Yeah. It's about how you use it so that you make it more equitable and more accessible and affordable for more. Yeah. Back to your metaphor of the bub bub tree for the, for the purpose framework. I think profit is the, the water, which, uh, you know, continues to, to nourish the tree to grow. And, uh, you know, I would always say it's incumbent on all businesses to be profitable. Otherwise, as you mentioned, yeah. you cannot reinvest, you can't continue to scale and grow. So, and even more important than prof profit, of course, is, is cash, which is, which is the fuel for, for real growth. So in terms of, you know, tying some of the bits together, actually, before we get into that, can you just give an overview of the, the UN SDGs for those listeners who may be hearing about it for the, for the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for the first time, Miriam? So... Oh, sorry, you want me to give you what the SDG stand for, or why? Yeah, ju ju just gi give give a, a quick overview of the UN SDGs and how okay. companies can link those uh, or use the SDGs to to start to frame their own purpose. Yeah, well, I, I, funny enough, I'm actually doing a lot of work right now helping a big company, and I won't mention which one, um, uh, through their supply chain to think about the social impact. Um, areas that they should be impacting throughout wherever they're sourcing and wherever they're operating. And the framework we're using is actually the SDGs because the SDGs, are, you know, I've already framed 17 areas in which we could drive impact, right? Ranging from reducing inequalities to quality education to employ employment and training to um, health um, and well being to, you know, water, sanitation. Um, so wherever you are in your business model, there must be an area in which you will want to make an impact, right? And I think this is a really good starting point in which you can frame what your goals and ambition would actually be. And that's always my starting point with the UN SDGs, right? So I believe very much that, um, you know, th this should be the, the, um, the guiding light for any business and the way I've framed, for example, brands on a mission vision is that we want to catalyze, um, you know, additional resources, investment from those business models that we're transforming towards the 1 billion, uh, you know, 1 billion euros towards the SDG. So that, you know, I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a gift given to this world, right? And I think this is what we need to articulate and think about as we progress. So I hope that gives you a bit of a, a summary of what I believe the strength of the SDGs can be. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an amazing um, source of inspiration for a lot of business models. If they can rethink their current business models to then be part of, you know, their existence should be a reason for solving one of the SDGs. You may not be able to do all of them, but you may think, and um, you know, there must be something that you can be helpful for. Yeah, and you know, I found it incredible and so profound when we think of the the number of things that countries and politicians in different countries fall out over and are in disagreement about that 193 countries of kind of the 200 plus countries globally were united in these 17 sustainable development goals and uh, agreed the, the, the initiatives and the, the KPIs that sit beneath those goals in terms of what they want to achieve by 2030. So there's, there's a great reference guide there for, for every company who has ambition to scale, regardless of their size, they will find Certainly, I would assert that I'd find something within those KPIs that that sit underneath those seventeen goals, just to get them started. And I'm keen to get your take on that, Miriam. Would you say, you know, perfection could be the the enemy of progress here if companies start to to really get tied up in the in, in, you know, the exactness of, a, of, of an alignment to a certain goal or a certain KPI, would you assert just, just get started, you know, just pick one, pick, you know, and, and go for it. And, and that momentum should ultimately create a level of movement. Yes and no. 
Um, so I think for me, the way, and I have a specific um, tool that I use in, you know, in products that I give to company as well, which is called Dream the Mission Workshop, which is basically looking at how you, you come up with your social purpose, right? Your social purpose first needs to have um, a business needs, right? So I don't believe in you just going to look and think about a social goal um, from the SDGs that are, is not aligned to your business uh, goal. I don't, I think it's not sustainable and I've talked about this before. I think if you're a toothpaste, you have a lot of work to do on, you know, making sure that you know, oral health is done around the world, right? And that we're training more dentists and that, you know, we're getting more kids to brush their teeth before they go to sleep. I mean, honestly, you know, you have no business going to, I don't know, um, I'm not sure, like uh, you have no business going to think about, uh, uh, I don't know, something about industry, um, you know, planning or, or, or you know, like I, I find that that is not the best way. If you could already get your business model of selling the best toothpaste that can be as inclusive and can be affordable. And that for me is the best that you can do in terms of your business model. And I, and I always think about that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a priority, right? Um, I think the second thing that's, um, that's, that's really critical is once you've identified what is the business need that you have and what is the social area that you might be able to impact with this business, resolving this business need, you will find a sweet spot that will enable you to now come up with what I call a social mission, which is a measurable, meaningful objectives that enable you to respond to your business need and hopefully, and also link back to a social goal. It isn't just pick one and go for it because <coughs> it's not sustainable. Sorry, I needed some water. Hope you can edit this bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. So ultimately what we're saying is there's 17 goals. There's more than 300 KPIs that, that sit underneath those goals that find one that that aligns to your own business you know the the toothpaste company you know clearly good health and well-being is the obvious one there as opposed to the goal around infrastructure for example i think is what you're alluding to you know the goals give enough breadth and scope for every company to find some level of alignment would you agree completely i completely agree i think uh, I, they give you clarity and help you refine now what your mission will be, right? Yeah. And give you something to, to work on. Um, and, um, but it, it isn't um, a golden finalization of, of where you are. Sorry, I'm getting little messages now. <laughs> um, and um, and um, so it gives you real clarity um, and, um, and um, uh, you know, in terms of that. Sorry, just one second, pause. I need to, I'm now being asked. <laughs> I'm, being sent, I'm being sent notes through the door to come back. <laughs> Did you ask my friend, are they coming? Circle yes or no. <laughs> I, sorry, I don't think it's, sorry. Oh, that's <laughs> brilliant. Uh, sorry. Rob, I'm I had sorry, to, I had I had to, to, I had to at the end sorry about that yeah, yeah. no no problem look so in terms of what has happened in the world in the last 18 months miriam with covid and i feel certainly on a personal level a new level of consciousness in relation to to why i do what i do and the world that we live in what would you like to see companies doing now? I feel that there's an opportunity here for companies now really to harness the power of purpose. Would you agree? And does COVID provide the catalyst for this? Yes, I agree 100%. Um, obviously, I feel like COVID has gotten a lot of people um, to rethink about the importance of, of their mission and the reason why they exist um, and obviously we've all been faced with, you know, mortality and, and thinking about what's so important. And I think at the forefront of this is 
obviously, um, you know, a pandemic health and well-being um, challenge that we need to all sort, sort out between ourselves. And I think our humanity has been challenged, right? So, you know, everybody's looking for more a, a more empathetic way to respond to this, right? In a way that's going to be more inclusive. We're all trying to find solutions because, you know, somebody non-vaccinated somewhere is, you know, is an issue for everybody else around the world, right? So I... I believe that um, you know more than ever there is a need for these inclusive business models, and that these inclusive business models are not um, you know they, they do not operate in a vacuum. They operate as part of a, a an ecosystem of, um, of of people trying to drive solutions, and companies have to find what works for them <laughs> to be able to drive that. And if your business models is obviously you're the world's largest beer company and you're thinking about you know the reduction of harmful use of alcohol because you want to keep your consumers in the future because more people are thinking also about you know what are the choices in terms of non-alcoholic beers for example um you know you have no choice but to be a thought leader in that space right and i see many companies that are actually taking that steps moving forward to be this thought leader in front of where they are yeah and on that on that note of being a thought leader, how important is it to have a compelling purpose in what is being called kind of the era of the great resignation in terms of attracting talent and retaining talent? I, you know, I'm a startup. I've been a startup for like, what, a year, a year and a half. Um, we've put on a job description for a social mission manager. Um, and I've just gotten 140, you know, CVs. Wow. And I'm talking about, you know, Stanford, Yale, wow. Harvard, um, you know, best of, you know, University of Cape Town. I mean, and I looked at this and I said, goodness, you know, like the need that people have to be able to find a real, um, you know, a real purpose and really be able to see meaning to what they do is something to not be underestimated. And yet you have these big companies that may have bigger packages. I mean, honestly, I can't guarantee a salary past three months. You never know. I'm a startup, right? I mean, that's the reality. I hope none of them are listening right now, but <laughs> um, that number will drop significantly. But the, the truth is, is that you know, and I believe that we're going to make it. And I believe that, you know, the more we, we do good and the more we show the way we're working and how these business models are operating, the more there is. But there is a genuine belief, right, that it is possible that you can translate this purpose into impact and that we've got a roadmap. Um, you know, and I, I think this great resignation is a good and important moment for companies to rethink, you know, how they're going to really drive this purpose, right? Because, you know, it's not enough to just state your purpose. You need to really walk the talk. People are looking at you uh, these days, right? Um, you know, you can't just be sitting here and thinking about your, your, you know, your own self comfort when you're not thinking about everybody else, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I think it's not easy for companies, for sure. Um, and the private sector, but I think embracing a purpose fully um, really drives results and, um, and, and attracts the best possible talent, which I think will be profitable. And I, if you're not ashamed about making profits, which, you know, we're, we're not, but, you know, it, it, it's like I, I keep going back to that. You can make this profit very purposeful. And purpose can be really profitable. And you need to just find what works. And I, I think there's a limit, right? So, um, you know, the, there's a limit to how much money one can make. I mean, at least for me, I mean, I'm not one a billionaire, but, you know, I just think about the kind of impact and legacy you can make and leave in this world is probably a lot more important. And I think more and more, um, you know, younger talent are seeing that. They don't want to wake up in the morning. They'd rather wake up in the morning thinking about eliminating malaria in this world. They want to wake up thinking about, you know, getting people to drink water. They want to wake up thinking about how do we create a startup that's going to change the world and create a new home and, and give them values that they can relate to. And I, and, you know, and, and this is why, you know, so quickly the company has become so attractive to some of the best talents in the world. 
Well done, you. Uh, that's uh, you will be the envy of many companies uh, who are really struggling for talent at the moment. But again, it it highlights and illuminates the significance of having a purpose at your core. You've been really generous with your time, Miriam. I know it's late in the evening with you in Africa at the moment. Before you go, could you leave our listeners with three timeless takeaways? Oh, wow. Three, yeah? <laughs> um, I would say today, I, I think it's important to be authentic and lead authentically. So I think you need to, you know, I mean, I, and I'm going to go back to my purpose and, you know, falling in the septic tank and, and thinking about what you want to do and, and, the, and the drive and what drives you, right? So really trying to see whether you can be the voice of, of many that may not have this voice, right? So I think to whom more is given, more is expected. And I really believe that. So I want people to start thinking about being authentic um, in their leadership, because I don't think you can drive any purpose work unless you're authentic with your leadership and people see right through you. So I think that's number one. I think, um, secondly, um, I, I want us to start thinking about, you know, obviously a world where um, you're thinking about reducing inequalities at all point in time, right? So, you know, the, the more we, you know, the, the more we are thinking about the, the, the people that don't have, the, the more inclusive of a business model we will create, right? So reducing inequality should be at the forefront of our, of our thinking. And um, when we think about rethinking, you know, when we think about these business models we're changing. And for me, that means many things, right? It means about, it means thinking about the vulnerable communities everywhere. It thinks, it means putting a, you know, thinking about women and children in, in, in a lot of aspects or the elderly or, or, or you know, or, 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 you know, differently abled, you know I mean? It's about thinking about, you know, creating a more equitable world. So I think that's, that's the second one. I think the third one is, um, is, you know, not being afraid to create, um, um, you know, examples, right? So, you know, of course you, you, you're you gonna succeed and you're gonna fail fast, um, you know, and you should learn to do that very quickly. But I think the more examples of successful models and business models that have tapped into purpose and that can share these, the more we will have, um, you know, a roadmap to business models that, can do this, right? So I, I believe in in, um, in in you know encouraging people to just go ahead identifying. So the purpose ground isn't one to play with, but it is definitely one that you can embrace. The problem is you're going to have to embrace it for a long time. I love those. Lead authentically. Ensure that the reduction of inequality is the is at the core of your purpose, and be an exemplar. Uh, create new business models for others to to follow. Miriam, I've really enjoyed the last hour. It's been wonderful talking to you. You're such an inspiration. I wish you all the very best in the future. I've no doubt there's 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 more books on the way. Can you you know can you share with our listeners what's next? And if uh, people want to to reach out and connect with you, how best to do that? Oh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I am really focusing on this startup, Brands on a Mission, because I think it's a huge um, opportunity to transform the business models of big and small companies. Um, and one of the key things that we're going to try to deliver this year is we're going to create the very first um, purpose to impact tool and ranking um, um, index for companies to really check and diagnose where they are from purpose to impact, right? So that they can really check where the, whether their business model is really, really driving impact. So it's gonna be called Purpose to Impact. So check it out very soon. Um, we're gonna launch it before the end of this year. Um, and I am hoping to write another book that's probably, I haven't figured out the title yet, but it is definitely the various ways in which companies bullshit their ways around purpose, you know, something along the, those lines. I, I want to establish myself as the purpose bullshit detector. If one can see that. So, um, 
<laughs> I don't know if that's going to yield me more client or no client, um, but um, <laughs> so you're going to become the the, I, the the PBD then, yes. The, the <laughs> PBD for sure. Um, yeah, and and I mean, I just want to continue having fun doing what I'm doing, right? Yes. So um, I think this is super important um, as well, right? I. I I, I, you know, I want to embrace my motherhood. I want to embrace um, the relationships that are really important in my life at the moment as well. And, and hopefully create a home for many entrepreneurs that can come and do this as well. Right. So, and this is, this is, this is, this is what's important for me. Brilliant. And uh, if people want to connect with you, how would, how do they reach out to the PBD? <laughs> um, they can write, well, it's very easy to find me online, but they can write at uh, mission at brandsonamission.com if um, they want us to take them on a mission. Brilliant. Well, the last hour has been hugely enjoyable, Miriam. Go and uh, enjoy your wonderful kids. I know they're waiting to, uh, to have mum put them to bed. So it's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure and privilege hosting you on the Scalex Insider. Uh, I wish you all the very best. Take care. Thank you so much, Brandon. It's been a pleasure too.